Michael, there's a number of quotes they wanted to emerge from tonight. One of the speakers thanked the president for having sacrificed the life that he built. Another speaker, as well documented already, called him the guardian of Western civilization. Still another called him a patient advocate on the medical side of the ledger. I want to play for you a bit of what the Democratic state lawmaker from Georgia had to say tonight. You may be wondering, why is a lifelong Democrat speaking at the Republican National Convention? And that's a fair question. And here's your answer. The Democratic Party does not want black people to leave their mental plantation. We've been forced to be there for decades and generations. But I have news for Joe Biden. We are free. We are free people with free minds. And I'm part of a large and growing segment of the black community who are independent thinkers, and we believe that Donald Trump is the president that America needs to lead us forward. Michael, please go first, and then I imagine our colleagues may want to follow. Yeah, well, you know, uh, okay, that, that's one view of the world. Uh, the reality of it is you then have to look at how that is played out in the black community. You have to look at how it's played out across America. Um, Donald Trump got 8% of the black vote in 2016. Um, he's now significantly below that going into this cycle. Um, I don't know what that means for, for every black person in the country, but it says to me that you haven't made the case well enough. Um, it, over the last four years. Uh, and, but there's also the point about uh, that, is, that is true about our politics is that, yeah, politics can put you in sort of a, a, a mindset where you only see one side of it or only see one thing. Um, so I appreciate the brother coming out and standing on the Republican stage. Um, and I'm sure a lot of Republicans are applauding him. So I think you should applaud me as I stand on the other side of the stage to say I'm a free thinker as well. Um, so and that's the rub. Free thinking only applies when you agree with me. Well, that's not free thinking and that's not American. Michael Steele, I want to ask you a question about Nikki Haley's speech. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have enough time to unpack the whole what of Nikki Haley there. But I want to ask you, she was talking about um, the mass shooting at Mother Emanuel yes. Church. And she said this. After that horrific tragedy, we didn't turn against each other. We came together, black and white, Democrat and Republican. Together, we made the hard choices needed to heal and removed a divisive symbol peacefully and respectfully. Um, did I miss something? Isn't Donald Trump's, one of his pillars of his candidacy, the preservation of our heritage, including the Confederate flag? Isn't he on the attack against NASCAR for banning it? That's the, ir the irony. The uh, that you see on that stage. You, you have someone like Governor Haley who, who did the stand-up thing, rallied the state around her, uh, got the legislator to, legislature to act, to take down those symbols of hatred that were offensive to not just her community, but the communities across the country. And yet tonight she stands on the stage supporting a man who sees those very same individuals um, as good people, uh, or those symbols don't touch them. So how, I don't know how you how you traverse that logic. I don't know how you say in, in a sentence in a, in a speech like that that this is what I did and Donald Trump stands with me. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't because his words and his actions are 180 degrees from the actions and the words that you made back then. So that tonight, and I think someone already mentioned this. It may have been Rachel. So. The way this is playing out is that you see these conflicting moments in your head is going, wait a minute, <laughs> you're kind of playing tennis because one, the speakers are saying one thing, but reality is telling you something else or Donald Trump is doing something else. And that's going to be the difficulty of coming out of this convention, going to the American people and having them already made up their mind that this is a referendum on the last four years, uh, because I've got all this data now to choose from. Mm. Can I ask my, really quickly, Michael, because, you know, you, you made a really concerted effort when you were RNC chairman to try to bring more African-Americans into the Republican mm -hmm. Party. Um, and it was an effort based on policy ideas and saying, here's some policy ideas that you should be open to. We know that a lot of black people are culturally conservative and right. in, on the religious and conservative. So you saw an opening there. 
What do you make of what I saw as it appealed? There were at least four uh, African-American speakers tonight, including um, Herschel Walker, Kim Classic of Baltimore, uh, Vernon mm -hmm. Jones, who we just showed. What did you make of the substance of the pitch here? Because, you know, people would both of us know uh, that are still looking, working yeah. in the campaign and working in, and near it, know that Donald Trump is trying to go for 15 percent of African-American black men. What did you hear tonight and what do you make of it? Yes, well, to, to your first point, in, in 2010, in fact, I was very, very happy and proud to see two of the candidates that I supported and got elected in 2010, uh, then Congressman uh, Tim Scott and Governor Nikki Haley. Um, and they were representative of the field of candidates that we wanted to put out before the country. They talked about our values. They talked about the things that mattered, um, certainly to Republicans, but more importantly and more broadly to every citizen. You didn't really hear that tonight. It was it was almost this sense of, uh, you know, sort of talking about how bad it was and and well, you know, it's that bad, and therefore you need to come over to us. Well, tell me what you're going to do to 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 transform my community. How what policy are you are you looking to put on the table? You you can talk about you know uh, you know opportunity zones and things like that. But you should know also that the black community has other things in the economic piece in, in mind. Uh, they want to know seriously how you're going to approach policing. They want to know seriously how you're going to approach redlining. That would have been a nice topic to talk about. The, the gentrification of black neighborhoods, for example. Um, what do you talk about that? How, how do you help a family, a black family that's been in a neighborhood from se for 70 years stay there? So then you begin to open up the avenues in which you can have that conversation, which is what we tried to do 10 years ago, which unfortunately, I think, uh, given the politics of trying to segment the black vote, give us black men because black men like the whole machismo thing, um, that works until they talk to the black female in their household, who reminds them exactly how they're going to vote. <laughs> That is deep truth. That's real. That's real. Just saying. No, that's real. <laughs> um, with thanks to uh, all of our friends, especially to Michael for leaving us with some vivid imagery playing tennis <laughs> by Gaslight. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.